I'd like to introduce you all to John Freed, the president of the New York chapter of RCA. I just want to start by thanking the Song Gummy Club for having us here tonight. And I want to thank all of you for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Um, Dr. Breyer he is uh, someone who has quite a, uh, a very well deserved reputation in Egyptology. He is the author of numerous books. His most recent is Tudor Gaman and The Tomb That Changed the World. And he's also written a book called Cleopatra's Needles, which will be the topic of tonight's uh, talk. He has appeared on 60 Minutes, CNN, and uh, numerous National Geographic specials. And uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Breyer. Thank you. Well, I'd like, I'd like to say that first about Daniel was asking me, oh, you wrote a book about you know, the Luxor Obelisk. The answer is no, it's not my book. Um, I translated it. It's, it's a story I've wanted to tell for, for, for many, many years. Um, and it's about Apollinaire Lebon, it's his book, right? And he is a man who moved the obelisk to Paris, the Luxor obelisk, right? And it's an incredible story that people don't know. Um, and I'll explain. Um, but let me give you a little background on obelisks. Now, most people, I think, would say, let me just move this chair. Most people would say that the pyramids are probably the greatest engineering achievement of, of the Egyptians. They're really wrong. They are really wrong. For me, it's obelisks. Obelisks are really the greatest achievement. Let me, and I will explain. Right? The obelisks, right? Um, the word obelisk, by the way, is Greek. Right? It's the Greek word for a meat skewer, like in shish kebab. Because when the Greeks came into Egypt, they saw them and they said, oh, it looks like meat. Right? And that's what they called it. So, now the things about obelisks are, they're a single piece of stone. They're a single piece of stone. The big ones average between maybe 230 tons and 330 tons. So a big piece of stone, right? Big piece. But you'll see. Now, the thing that makes them amazing is that they're made out of granite, which is a hard stone. When the Egyptians were quarrying and raising obelisks, the tools that they had, the metal tools they had, were copper and bronze. Two relatively soft metals, right? Relatively soft. You cannot cut granite with either copper or bronze. Right? So how do they do it? The answer is going to be revealed in the next slide. That's how they did it. That's a pounder. It's a stone made of a slightly harder material than the granite. Right? It's dolerite. And what they did to pound out the obelisks, well, I'll show you. They would take the ball, crouch, and drop it, drop it, drop it. And they would pound the obelisk out, right? Um, you can see here a trench that's been made in the granite quarry at Aswan. And what you had here are guys next to each other, shoulder to shoulder. One guy in each little trench here in the deep trench, and they just keep pounding all day long. It's not a great job. Um, the, um, there was an expression in ancient Egypt. He was sent to the granite. And it sounds like it was for prisoners. Right? They didn't have slaves in Egypt, not large amount of slave labor. But it was sent to the granite. Right? So this is an amazing achievement. Now, Mark Lehner, a friend of mine, did an experiment. How long does it take to pound out an obelisk? Well, he tried in, in a minimal way. He took the pounder started on the granite, and he found out that you can go about a quarter of an inch in an hour right, by pounding. Right? Quite something. But you'll see. These are amazing. Now, here I am sort of trying to figure out how to get it out from, how to get the bottom part of the obelisk scale, right? And I was sort of fiddling with this, and then I realized almost certainly they would have put it on a pendulum, like put it on a string, and just whoosh, boing, boing, like that. I think. I think. I'll show you what the, the trench looks like. There, you can see guys shoulder to shoulder. Right? One guy here, one guy here, just pounding, pounding, pounding. But you ain't seen nothing yet. This is the big baby. This is the one that nobody has any idea of how they were going to move. And I mean no one has any idea. It's the largest obelisk ever attempted. Right? It's still in the quarry. They never got it out. While and here's where they pounded. Right? They pounded down here and down here. 
And when they were cutting it out, pounding it out, it cracked. Right? It's one of those moments, no, you tell the Pharaoh, no, you tell the Pharaoh. <laughs> um, but it's, it's so large, it's hard to conceive of it, really. Um, it weighs, you ready? A thousand tons. It weighs as much as two jumbo jets. Right? And how are they going to get it out of the quarry? It's right in the middle of the quarry. How are they going to raise it up? Or are they going to carve out the wall? I mean, this may be one case where the Egyptians bit off more than they could chew. They may have undertaken something that they really couldn't complete. But this is just an amazing I mean, bit of hubris to try something like this. Um, let me show you a couple of things. That's the obelisk. That's the tip of the obelisk. And you can see the pound marks. They were pounding over there, getting the tip ready when it cracked. Now, how are they going to move it? We have a couple of representations of how the Egyptians moved large objects, large objects, on the ground. This is one of our best, right? This is from a guy, Jehudi Hotep, and this is a statue of him. It's in his tomb. They painted it in his tomb. He had this big colossal statue made of himself, 54 tons roughly, right? 54 tons. Not a thousand tons. Right? And it shows how they're moving it. But it's on a sled. And on here, on, his, on the lap of the statue, is a guy who's clapping. He is rhythming the pullers, the guys who have the ropes. Now, in this depiction, we know it's 174 people. So it took 174 people to move this thing of about 50 tons. Right? Think about 1,000 tons. You're talking about thousands of guys. Thousands. It doesn't scale up. You can't have rope that big. Where are you going to put thousands of guys on a rope? It just doesn't work. Um, interestingly, by the way, you can see here, there's one guy on the sled on the front by the foot, and he's pouring oil to lubricate it as they pour it. And there are guys here who are carrying spare planks of wood in case something breaks, in case the sled breaks. And these guys have jars of water for these guys to drink. Okay? So from, from this tomb, we get an idea of how they move things, but it won't work for the big obelisk. It will not work for it. Well, so we really don't know how they're going to do that one. But anyway, um, this is helpful. Now, we have one representation of obelisks being moved on water. Now, I think an interesting thing that nobody's ever said, but I think it's true. I really do. The, all, obelisks, all obelisks in Egypt come from one quarry. All granite obelisks come from one quarry at Aswan. They all come from the same quarry. Right? Aswan is on the southern border of Egypt. If that quarry was on the northern border, I don't think they could have used that, the granite. Because you've got to go with the current. You can't take a 320 ton thing on a bar against the current. So I think the fact that it's in the south made it usable. And, and just to reinforce my idea, there are no obelisks south of Aswan. They never wrecked them south, like in Nubia or anything like that. So I think it's fortunate for them that it was in the south. Now this is Hatshepsut's representation of how she moved two of her obelisks. And what's really cool, I and mean, this is again, you know, just hubris, she put both of them on one barge. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I mean, what if it stinks? Right? But she's got two obelisks, the tip's there, tip is there. Now the reason you see these little rectangles, the little tiny rectangles, is Egyptian boats were sewn together. They didn't nail them together, they didn't have pegs or anything like that. They're called sewn boats, and this is where the ropes went through to hold the planks together. When you put it in the water, right, the ropes swell, you know, and it works. Um, so anyway, that's Hatchup's you know, rendition of how she moved it. By the way, you're not seeing the whole thing. There's one little boat there, there were 23 of them towing it. Right? 23 towing it with three pilot ships. So at least we know for smaller obelisks how they were moved on boat. <coughs> now, by smaller obelisks, you mean 100 tons? No, I mean 230 tons. 230. Not the big baby, just but 230 to 320, something like that. Now, how did they erect them? 
Egyptians never told us, right? never showed us. Um, this is a theory, I think it's a good theory, uh, proposed in the 1920s by Rex Engelbach. Um, here's a temple. Obelisks always come in pairs, they're in front of the temple. They don't say much, by the way, obelisks. They have hieroglyphs on them, but they're really just naming the pharaoh, saying he's a wonderful guy, very powerful. That's it, but not historical data. So anyway, the obelisk, we think, is on a sand mound, and it's going to slide down onto the pedestal, and then with ropes, they're going to pull it up. I think that's right. I'll tell you why. When I was doing my book on obelisks in general, I was looking at the bases. There's, there are quite a few bases left with no obelisks, because the Romans took them. Right? The Romans took them. And when you look at the base, there's almost always a groove in the base, and I think that groove is to catch the back edge of the obelisk so it doesn't slide off. Right? So it stops it, and you pull it up. Right? So that's, I, think, I think that's a reasonable, you know, you can imagine how they got it up. Uh, this is, now this is the start. This is not a buy my book ad. Um, this is the start of my interest in Le Bas, Apollinaire Le Bas, who moved the Paris obelisk. I was doing this book and researching all the obelisks in the world, practically, and then I came across Le Bas' story, written in French, and I just thought, this is a fabulous story. This guy's so great, um, and nobody knows it. So then I translated the book. It's not my book. Now, am amazingly, this is a little known fact, um, at one point, Egypt gave away five obelisks to France. They didn't care about them. They really didn't. Um, the ruler was Muhammad Ali Pasha, who was really Albanian, not Egyptian. What did he care? Right? They were just stones. So two of them that were given away are these, by the way. Um, Alexandria. One is fallen. It fell in the Middle Ages, but didn't break. And the upright obelisk. Right? They were given away, but the French never took them. Never took them. Right? They're going to be taken in the 19th century, one by the British, one by the Americans. That's why we have an obelisk in Central Park. I'll show you a little bit about it, but that's not the main. Now, the, the English one was moved in a caisson, like a cigar tube. You know, those fancy cigars come in those tubes. Um, this is the caisson that the, the obelisk is in it, and it's being towed by a steamship. And there's a crew on this little caisson, three guys, and they communicated with the steamship with the chalkboard. You can go faster. <laughs> and stuff like that. Slow down. And it's being towed to London. They hit bad, bad weather. The obelisk, cap the obelisk ship capsizes. Right? There are three guys on this thing. It's a hurricane. And they've got to get them off. Five brave men are lowered in a rowboat from this ship in a hurricane. And they start rowing to the obelisk. When they get to it to get the guys off, a big wave swamps the boat and they disappear forever. And five brave men died trying to rescue their colleagues. And eventually, the ship gets a rope, a line to them, and they are rescued. But five brave men lost their lives. By the way, there's a crazy story. I can't tell all the stories, but this obelisk, you know, they had to cut it free once they get the guys off, because they're afraid it's going to go down and take the ship with it. So they, they, they leave it there, and they come back the next day when the weather's better to look for it, and it's gone. They figure it sank, right? But it didn't. It was floating, and another ship comes along in another day and finds it. And according to the laws of the sea, it's theirs. It's salvage. And the Brits had to buy it back. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting court case, by the way, because the, I mean, the Brits, who don't want to pay too much, are saying, well, it's just a piece of stone. How much is a piece of stone worth? Oh, a couple hundred dollars, you know. And, and, and the, of course, the guys who found it say, well, I think there are a lot of cities that are paying more than that. So anyway, they had to pay 3,000 pounds sterling to get their albums back. So that's the one that's today on the Thames Embankment, right? And if you go to visit it, the, the, the tube station is called Embankment. Um, if you go to visit it, walk to the back, and there's a plaque that has the names of the five brave men who died trying to save the column. And there's an ancient Egyptian saying, to save the name of the dead is to make him live again. So whenever I go there, I always read the names. So do that. It's a good thing to do. Um, right on the Thames Embankment. So that's, that's London. 
We, of course, have this one. This is ours. This is the one that's in Central Park today. Right? Uh, that's in Central Park, and it's being moved by Lieutenant Goring, a uh, naval man, and it's clad in wood to make sure it's, you know, it's not damaged, and you have the obligatory flag on top. And he had a trunnion built. They're going to they're gonna pivot it on this. Right? Pivot it. This trunnion, by the way, is built by the Roebling Ironworks in New Jersey, who had just done the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm -hmm. right? So they're going to pivot it. Interestingly, he has piled up these timbers so that in case a rope breaks or a cable breaks, it'll stop the fall of the obelisk. And it happened. A cable broke. And it saved them. It saved them. Then he had his ship, the Dasug, he opens the hull and rolls the obelisk in on cannonballs. Okay? Seals it up and sails off. That's the obelisk going through Central Park on a, tr on a trestle. It's being pulled by a steam engine here. Yanking it, they have an anchor chain to it, and they just shh, shh, move it up, move it up, and they keep going into Central Park. Right? Interesting, by the way, you know where the tennis courts are on, on, the, on, the, you know, on the west side? Yeah. It, that's where the obelisk was landed. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason it was landed there is because it's the only place where there's a break in the, in, in the cliff. Right? So they had a little low they could get it on. But that's, that's our obelisk here in the Central Park. And there it is, right? And there's our pedestal, right? Crazy story about the pedestal. Crazy. Gorinch was a mason, right? 32nd degree mason. The guy who paid for it was Vanderbilt Mason, right? So he knew the secret handshake. Right? And when Gorin got there to Egypt and is clearing the sand from the obelisk, he finds the pedestal, and by the pedestal, he finds Mason's tools, like hammers and right angles and things like that. And he thinks that that is his fellow Masons from Egypt, leaving him a message that he has to bring the pedestal to. So that's why we are the only ones who have the original pedestal. 50 tons. It's 50 tons. Yeah. Anyway. So that's our obelisk. Now for the real story. Apollonia Laba and the French obelisk. This is Luxor Temple in 1800. The two obelisks here. This is the one Laba is going to move. And the reason he's going to pick this one is Champollion, the decipher of hieroglyphs, told him, get this one, it's the best one in Egypt. So he's going to do that. He is going to get this obelisk by hook or by crook. This is the temple today. And as you can see, he did get it. It's gone. Of all the objects in Egypt that should be, or not in Egypt, that should be returned to Egypt, I would like the obelisk returned. Wouldn't it be neat to have the symmetry and have them both there? There's no temple with the both obelisks in front of it. It'd be just so neat. It's not going to happen, but I think you could have a, a replica made and it would still be pretty good. Uh, but that's the temple as it is today. There's Apollo Melaba, little guy, 5'4. Five, 5'4. Four, five, four. He's an engineer from the Ecole Polytechnique. He's um, about 30 years old, and he's given the job. He is the first guy to move an obelisk who really knew what he was doing. I will explain. This is his book. He wrote a book in 1839 about moving the obelisk. This is where I get my stuff from, this book. Um, and it's a fabulous story. The guy is great. Um, and it, it, nobody knows this book. It's published by, you can see it down here, um, it's, it's published by the, the, the Royal Corps of Bridges, Roads, and Mines. Right? <laughs> not a bestseller, I don't have a good distribution, it's not every bookstore. <laughs> nobody read it, nobody read it. And I got to tell you, there's some great stuff in there. Um, so that's what I, tra that's, this is where I translate it and becomes this book here, The Luxor Obelisk. AUC Press did a wonderful job, by the way. I'm thankful to them. They, they have all the diagrams. They have all the beautiful illustrations, everything there. And they gave it a nice format so you can open it up and you have double space spreads. But they did a great job. Now, this is a ship specially designed to bring back the obelisk. Specially designed. It has to go both on the river and on the Mediterranean. Not easy. Right? It's got to sail. It's got to go up a river, which is not too deep. Um, what they're going to do, though, is it came over by itself, but with an obelisk in its hull, 
it's not going to be able to go by itself on the sail, so they're going to have a steamer pull it. And that's the plan. And it works out. So that's his ship. Now what he does, smart guy, he intentionally runs it aground at Luxor. So it's fixed, right? It's at right angle to the bank. This is his diagram of how he's going to lower the obelisk. And this is how he did it. There's ropes around it, and he's going to have winches lowering it slowly, right? Now, when I say he's the first guy ever to know what he's doing, I mean that literally. He's a graduate of a, of a techie school. He can do the math. He can do the calculations. He knows, for the first time of anybody who's doing this kind of thing, coefficient of friction on the ropes. Right? He knows how much power a capstan, a winch, will generate. So he does it minimally. And it's, it's elegant, it's simple, it's fast, it's wonderful. And he's so proud of it. If you can read at the bottom of his diagram, which is in the book there, this operation took 25 minutes. He lowered it in 25 minutes. I mean, just remarkable. Just, just an incredible guy and fearless. He, by the way, was a wonderful human being. He had, some, he had so many things thrown at him. The first thing he does when he lands his ship, they, all the guys get off and they run to the obelisk. They want to see it, right? And he looks at it. And there's a huge crack going through it. And Champollion told him, this is perfect obelisk. Nobody knows why Champollion said that. Maybe he made a mistake, maybe he meant the other. But this is the obelisk that he's got. And he's, he's wondering, is it going to break when I lower it? So his stonemason comes and he asks the stonemason, what do you think? Stonemason takes his hammer, bang, listens, says, it'll be okay if we lower it slowly. That's what he said. And it was. And it was. <laughs> So anyway, he also, by the way, when, he, when he's hiring workmen to clear away the sand, a blind woman, a blind old woman comes to him and says, I can't do any work, but you should hire me. I will pray for you and you'll be successful. And he hired her. <laughs> he's a good man. That's a depiction of lowering the obelisk. Interesting story here with the flags. His men are very eager. You know, They go up to the top and they plant the flag as always, right? And they say, now it's really ours. And Labas says, don't sell the bear skin until you kill the bear. <laughs> That's a great phrase. So it's, not, it's not ours yet. It's not down. But they did get it down. Now, I want to compare what Labas did with the previous obelisk moved 250 years earlier by Dominica Fontana. Right? Now, this is the title page of Fontana's book. Right? It's about him moving an obelisk. It's 1585 is when he moves it. Right? It's in Rome, his obelisk. You know, Rome had more, had, still has more obelisks than all of Egypt. There are more obelisks in Rome than in Egypt. The Romans took them back as trophies. They also never recorded how they brought them back and how they erected them. But it must have been easy, because they had 13, 14, 15 of them, and they never recorded it. See? They had winches, though, and pulleys, so it wasn't any big deal to them, but it's still pretty good. Now, Fontana is going to move this obelisk. Now, of all the obelisks brought back by the Romans, only one remains standing past the Middle Ages. Only one, this one. Now, the reason is interesting. This is the obelisk, by the way, that's in front of the Vatican today. It's going to be moved a quarter of a mile, that's all, from the old location to the new Vatican. Why is this one standing when everyone else was pulled down? In the Middle Ages, the Christians were pulling down these pagan monuments right, with pagan scripts on them. This one was allowed to remain standing because it was... It was in Caligula's circus. The chariots went around it. And when St. Peter was crucified, if you remember, Peter is crucified, and he says, please crucify me upside down so I won't be mistaken for our Lord. I didn't want to be confused with Christ. So Peter is crucified in Caligula's circus, and the obelisk was a witness to that. And therefore the Christians allowed it to remain standing because it witnessed the martyrdom of Peter. 
So, and then a basilica is built in the urn. But now when the new St. Peter's Basilica is built at the Vatican, they want to move the obelisk. The Pope is um, Sixtus, Sixtus V. Right? The Pope want, wants this thing moved, right? and he puts it out for bids. Who's going to move it? Kind of like the, uh, the dome in Florence, right? Brunelleschi's dome. Puts it out for bids. Michelangelo is asked to move it. His response is, and if it breaks, doesn't want to move it. So engineers from all over the world come to show how they're going to do it. And Fontana, in his frontispiece, is showing you the different theories of how they're going to do it. These are little models that everybody brought, different, different ideas. Most of them, many of them, by the way, were afraid to take it down. They didn't know if it could support its own weight. They were afraid if it pivots, it might break. So they wanted to move it upright. So anyway, these are all the guys who lost. And Fontana's idea was to build this big, what he called the castello, the castle. And he's going to build this big superstructure to hold the obelisk. And this is it. This is his plan. And his plan is, of course, borne away on the wings of angels. <laughs> that's, that's Fontana. Divinely inspired Fontana, who had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> now, if you look, he opened St. Peter's Basilica, because when you rotate the obelisk to horizontal, it, it's going to hit the basilica anyway, so you need room. So you're going to rotate it. Right? Now, that's the Castello. Took a whole forest to build that sucker, and it's really big. And these are the block and tackle that he made to do it. This is the thing that our boy Labah, Paulina Labah, does in 25 minutes. Right? Um, takes him a year. Now, what he's going to do is going to have winches, capstans, raise it and lower it. Labah had 10 capstans. He could do the calculation. Fontana had 100. And it was like a zoo, I'll show you. There. These are, these are winches here. And horses and everybody going round and round and round. He just didn't know how much he needed. That's Labaz. Quite a contrast, because he knew what he was doing, he knew what he needed. Now, he's very proud of what he's done. And what he does at the end of his book, now remember, it's published by the school, by the, by the, the Royal Division of Mines and, and Roads and Bridges. So he publishes all his calculations. This is the first time anybody has ever done these calculations. And he's very proud of it, and that's from his book. And we translated them, so, so that we have it here. But it's pretty good. I mean, this is, a, this is real engineering. You know, the, the Fontana moving the obelisk, the medical Fontana moving the Vatican obelisk, is often touted as the greatest engineering triumph of the Renaissance. He didn't know what he was doing. He got lucky. Next time. Now, Lobar got a couple of surprises. When he takes the obelisk down, when he lowers it, he can see the top of the pedestal. The pedestal's high, by the way. It's about eight feet high. And a big piece of stump, 50 tons. And on the top of the pedestal are hieroglyphs. They were underneath the obelisk for 3,000 years. Right? They're the cartouche, the name of Ramses the Great. And this is Labaz's drawing of them. Now, why put the cartouches where you can't see them, right? Now, here's the reason. This is Ramses the Great's obelisk. And Ramses is often called by Egyptologists the Great Chiseler. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason he's the Great Chiseler is he would take other pharaohs' monuments, previous monuments, and chisel their names off mm -hmm. and put his. Mm -hmm. So when the gods looked down, they would think that Ramses built them. Right? So Ramses was used to carving other people's names out, and he wanted to make sure that his name was not carved out. So he put it underneath the obelisk where you can't carve it out. Now, the base is, is split in two. It's split in two in ancient times. And this is how they repaired it. This is called a butterfly cramp. And what they do is you cut out across. This is, imagine cutting into the stone this shape, about this deep. So you get like a bow tie, like Anthony's bow tie. Where's your, your audio visual aid? Audio visual aid. There it is. Right? And they cut that out so that, and then you put in a piece of wood or metal, right? wood or metal and then it can't move apart. 
right? So that's common. That's, when you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, by the way, you know there's a very large statue in the, uh, in the hall, in the entrance hall? Look at it. It's got those butterfly cramps on it. It cracked also. So he discovers that, first one ever to see that. Right? Now, he's got to get the obelisk to a ship. He's got it down. He's got to get it to a ship. Everything is thrown against this poor guy. Cholera strikes. Mm -hmm. And the Nile is closed. Nothing is coming south from Alexandria and Cairo to Luxor. And he's got his timber there. He needs the timber to get the obelisk from here. Right, that's the other obelisk. That's the second one. Here's his obelisk. From here to the ship, about a quarter of a mile. And he intended to make a slipway of wood. And you lubricate it, kind of like we saw in the other one. Now, he's out of wood. He can't do it. He has enough wood, as Carpenter tells him, to just about cover two-thirds of the obelisk. So they make a little slipway, kind of like this table, but a little longer. The obelisk is on it. They move it along to the front. The tip is sticking over. And then they take the, the wood in the back and move it to the front. So they keep on boop, 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 and eventually they get it there. He only needs three winches. And they're moving the obelisk slowly. But also, look at the amount of sand you had to move. And he gets it on the ship. Now, when he gets to the ship, he had a plan. He was going to open the hull and put the obelisk in, right? Slowing wrist. But he can't do that because he doesn't have wood to repair it. He doesn't have any wood to repair it. So what he does, his carpenter cuts the front of the ship off. One gets the obelisk in, and then they put it back. It's back. And it worked. It worked. So he's got the obelisk on. He now has to wait for the Nile to rise, which is seven months in the future. So he's got to wait seven months for the Nile to rise. Right? So he decides to go on a, on a trip south. He wants to see Nubia, south of Egypt. He wants to be a real adventurer. So what he does is he's worried that his ship in the sun, it's July, he's afraid the boards are going to crack in the sun. So he takes reed mats. This is the ship with reed mats. And he pays somebody to water it every day like a plant so that it won't crack. And it worked. So now he heads south with some of his men on a great adventure. They look at Abu Simbel. Right? They, they, they visit Abu Simbel. It's 1834. You know, it's a big deal. Well, not many people are that far south. And then, this is again a great thing about his book. I mean, he's such a human being. One of the things that impressed him most, this whole trip, is the dancing girls of Egypt. Mm -hmm. right? Particularly one troupe, where he witnesses what is called, it's, it's a well-known dance in Egypt, the dance of the bee. The Dance of the Bee. It's an early striptease. What it is, is the dancer starts dancing, and then she pretends that a bee has gotten under her shawl, right? and she throws the shawl off. And then the bee goes under whatever, and eventually everything's gone. Right? And, and LeBron is waxing poetic about it. I mean, he is explaining how this is such a fantastic, well beyond the ballets of Europe. <laughs> that's what he says. That's what he said. I mean, he was a changed man. What's really cool is there's an account of their, their adventure, their expedition, by the captain of his ship also, who says exactly the same thing. <laughs> it's the greatest thing he's ever seen. So that's one of the things that LeBron liked when he was there. Rough weather, it's being towed back by a steamship, but they make it. They make it. And this is a contemporary drawing. I think it's on the cover of the book. Yeah, yeah, this is it. Um, it's a contemporary drawing, October 25th, 1836. They are raising the obelisk. Now, another thing that I found in the Ba's book that I never heard anybody mention it, I mean, it's great. The Ba was a techie. He wanted to raise the obelisk with a steam engine. Now, steam engines were not used that much on land yet. They'll be used for the railroads very soon. But it's steam ships that steam was used. He wants to use it on land. 
and he wants to show everybody the miracle of steam, he's going to raise the obelisk with steam power. He gets his steam engine to do it. And he tries it out, and what happens is he's given a, a steam engine with a defective boiler, and it won't generate enough power to raise it. So he goes to plan B, winches, manpower, and he, and he gets it up. And with music in the background, it's very dramatic. Very dramatic. And that's the there's another, there's a painting. There are two accounts, contemporary depictions of it. And then you can see there are people selling food and stuff like that. And it's like a big event. And, and the, the king is there, is present, King, king Louis I. He's there. And he strikes a medal which actually mentions Le Bon under, under the emphasis of Monsieur Apollinaire Le Bon, engineer, marine engineer. And so the king, and it rewards him with a pension. Le Bon is set for life. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great adventure now. And there it is on the Place de la Concorde today. And as a, as a, as a really nice gesture to Le Bon, they show how he raised it on the pedestal. You can see that. Another crazy thing I just don't understand. Le Bon gets it to Paris. Great. Nobody's decided where it goes. <laughs> and they have to wait a year to quarry the stone for the pedestal. So they didn't get it ready in advance. It's when he gets it. Maybe they didn't think he could do it. I don't know. But, the, but it's all quarried after he gets it and has to wait another year. Right? By the way, something similar happened to the London obelisk. <clears throat> And this is, again, wacky. When they got it there, they didn't know where they were going to put it. So they made a wooden model of it, right? And they brought it through London, saying, how does it look here? <laughs> and if you, really, and if you, if, you look at the illustrated London, if you look at the illustrated London news, you will see the obelisk in front of Westminster Abbey, where it's not. And that's the wooden model. Right? But anyway, so, so Le Bon has to wait a year to get his, get his pedestal, but they do show his technique, which he's very proud of. And today you can visit Le Bon's grave, which I have. Um, he's buried at the famous Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, where all the great ones are buried. And I guess you can figure out which one is his. <laughs> and there he is, the great one. And that's my man, Apollonaire Le Bon. Um, so again, to say the name of the dead is to make them live again, and uh, I hope we've done something for that. Uh, but I'll be happy to ask you, answer questions. Thank you. Yes. Yes. What was the uh, political situation that led the French ask for the obelisk? Was it that the Egyptians decided it was maybe some good political act, some give and take, uh, lottery? Yes, the answer is yes. It, it is a political act. Um, Muhammad Ali wants to modernize Egypt, and European powers have that ability. So he's, he's quite happy to give away antiquities. And in return, he'll get medical corps coming and setting up hospitals, things like that. He actually took down entire temples, ground them into cement to build sugar refineries. And so he had no, no, no regard for the antiquities at all. But yes, it's political. We'll give you this. You do this for us. Yeah. Yes. I have a question about the hieroglyphics on the sides of the obelisk. Yes. Are they associated with any particular artist, or are they uh, a decree of the pharaoh himself, what he wants on them, what they say? All right. First, no artist is associated with them. Artists in ancient Egypt did not sign their works. The reason is that Egyptian art is almost eternal. It doesn't change. They didn't value creativity. This is why when you go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you can look at a statue from 200 BC, from 1000 BC, from 2000 BC. They all look the same. They all look Egyptian. You don't think of anything different. Very little change in 3000 years of Egyptian art. They, they felt if it wasn't broken, don't fix it. See, they, they were copyists. You know, if you wanted a new statue of the god, you get out the old one, and you told the guy to copy it. And that's what they did. Now, the, the inscriptions on the sides are formulaic. 
almost every obelisk has basically the same thing. It has the f every pharaoh had five names. Two were in cartouches, the ovals. And the reason they're called cartouches, by the way, is Napoleon's men, when they invaded Egypt in 1798, they saw these shapes, and it looked like a bullet upright. So they called it a bullet, cartouche, right? as in cartridge. But, but they're just the names of the pharaohs, and maybe something like saying, uh, great of bulls, strong of life, and that kind of thing. Nothing important at all, nothing new. Is there no written record of a pharaoh commissioning, I ordered so and so? There is, there is, there is. We, we have Hatshepsut, for example. Hatshepsut says, on the base of our obelisk, she says, you know, I, I commissioned this, and it was done in seven months. You know, she, she did an idea, so she did it pretty fast. Um, but also, by the way, Hatshepsut has a little coda to that. She's the pharaoh queen, right? She's a, she's a, she's a, a woman, the woman who's pharaoh, right? It's kind of difficult. And she says, at the end, she says, say not that I did not do this. Rather say, how like her. And so she knew that her, her name would be erased. People would, because she was a woman, they might have, she said, don't say I didn't do this. Yes? The evolution is central for how old is that? How old is it? It's, it's, um, I guess it's 3200 years, something like that. 3200? That's right, I think. It's, it's from 1313, yeah, it's about 3200. Who's obelisk is that one? 3200, what? Who's obelisk is that one? Tatmos third. Tatmos third. Yeah, Tatmos third. Yeah. How many, how many total obelisks are there known, and how many remain in Egypt? There's probably about 40 known obelisks. This includes broken ones, piecemeal, 13 in Rome alone, one in Turkey. You know, um, there are some small ones, that includes those. Um, in Egypt, I really don't know, I think it's about seven yes. that, are, that are upright. Yeah, that's it. I mean, they were all trophies taken to Rome, and that was it. Yes? If that giant uh, obelisk that you talked about yeah. not cracked, yes. a lot of theories out there that uh, how it would have taken that uh, obelisk out in that quarry. No theory. No theory. We all look at it and say, hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'll give you one theory. There's a real theory, but I don't think anybody could take it seriously. A, a, a good Egyptologist expert on stonework. His theory is the obelisk would have been raised with leverage. You kind of pry it up, throw some rocks under it, pry it up. It's a thousand tons. You know, who's not going to do that? Yeah. Um, they're, they're about the, some are almost the same as, as the Luxor obelisk. There, there's some big ones. I mean, the, the Vatican one is big. The, um, Lateran obelisk is 110, 110 feet is the tallest one today, right, 110 feet. But they're big. The, the ones the Romans took were 230 tons to 320 tons. Um, not only that, most of the obelisks that you see today in Rome had disappeared. What happened was the Christians pulled them down. Over the centuries, dirt builds up. The obelisk disappeared. Then when the Pope, right, Sixtus V, He's an antiquarian. He likes old things. He hires antiquarians, they're called, guys with long iron bars to go through Rome <laughs> trying to find the obelisks. And then they dig them up. And if it's broken in three pieces, they put it together and get it upright. So some of the obelisks are in great shape. Some are better than others. But, but, and there's probably plenty more on the buildings in Rome. Plenty more. That's still, that's How many become. can you see today in Rome? How many can you see today? Thirteen. Yeah, thirteen obelisks. Yeah. Well, we did it, guys. I, I can't, I know we have to end. If you want a book, I'm sorry, five books. I'm going to have five books here. You're welcome to buy a book. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. For those of you, uh, you can buy books and Bob will sign them. Thank you, everybody. Oh, we'll see you again on March 23rd, 21st. No. March 21st, there will be another presentation. Great. 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 Great.